We all know that before the United States Supreme Court, you have the appeal dealing with the National Association of Gun Rights versus the city of Naperville and the state of Illinois, not only trying to knock out the so-called assault weapon ban and the magazine ban, both by the city as well as by the state. I thought I'd talk about an excellent brief that the lawyers submitted on behalf of the plaintiffs, the National Association of Gun Rights, as well as Robert Bevis. I thought it was an excellent brief. I thought we'd talk about some of the highlights because this is the sort of thing that I think Justice Amy Coney Barrett's going to take note of. I'm also going to flag a couple little areas that maybe they could be slightly improved upon or supplemented. And uh, we'll talk about all that when we get back. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Box of Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and proud author of the new book, Disarmed, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. We're going to do some big videos on that coming up. You're going to really like the conclusions and information found in that book. All right, folks, we all know that Justice Amy Coney Barrett is looking very carefully at a request for an emergency injunction to the Supreme Court where they're asking the plaintiffs, the Second Amendment plaintiffs are asking Justice Barrett and the Supreme Court to enter an injunction in joining the so-called assault weapon bans and the bans of certain large, quote unquote, large capacity magazines, which are really just standard capacity magazines in Illinois and the city of Naperville. And I think it's pretty clear that Justice Barrett thinks that what happened with the district court in front of Judge Kendall, we've talked about this before, uh, was shall we say weak tea and made a lot of fatal, terrible legal mistakes, and was just sloppy reasoning all the way around, clearly inconsistent with Supreme Court precedent. And I'm sure uh, Justice Barrett and the rest of the Supreme Court that's looked at this case, including their law clerks, are noticing the same. So I do want to mention to you some of the very good arguments that were made uh, by the Second Amendment proponents, the Second Amendment plaintiffs on behalf of the uh, National Association of Gun Rights. I thought they were briefed at the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, because keep in mind that no matter what happens with the United States Supreme Court, whether that injunction is granted or denied by the Supreme Court, keep in mind that the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals out of Chicago, the appellate court overseeing Judge Kendall, is also going to have to render a ruling on the merits of this case and I wanted to talk a little bit about what I, what I consider to be a very strong brief for the Second Amendment, tracked a lot of the arguments we've talked about on this channel, a lot of the historical precedents, and I think overall they did a very good job. And I want to talk about some of the highlights of their brief, which I will link to down below. To begin with, the Second Amendment plaintiffs did an excellent job in footnote number one. What I've noticed, but what I've told you about before is that Judge Kendall in finding the Second Amendment did not protect so-called, uh, did not protect semi-automatic rifles or magazines that hold more than 10 rounds. Uh, she adopted, believe it or not, which is just absurd, she adopted the propaganda language of the anti-gun movement by talking about assault weapons, which is just plain stupid for so many reasons, uh, not least of which is the Supreme Court has indicated that that's not a proper term. And I think that the plaintiff's lawyers in this case, uh, that's the law firm of Barry Arrington and uh, Jason Craddock are the lawyers on this again, you can take a look at their uh, their brief down below. Uh, they did a very good job, and I think at footnote number one just just sets the right tone, where they quote Clarence Thomas in a case, not technically a Second Amendment case, but they talk about how the phrase assault weapon is a political propaganda term. It has no meaning, and it should not be adopted. And even though they may use the phrase assault weapon in the context of the brief, they point out, point out right up front that they're not adopting this, and it should not be adopted. And even the U.S. Supreme Court, including Clarence Thomas, has noted that this is not correct language. And of course, in my Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy argument that has been repeatedly cited by many people, I make this exact same point that the phrase assault weapon or assault rifle is nothing more than a made up term. I'll also put a link to that law review article down below, but uh, you don't need to read it unless you're a super big geek. After debunking the notion that semi-automatic rifles are assault weapons and making it clear that the Supreme Court agrees with them, uh, the Second Amendment lawyers then go on to make an obvious point, which is the slam dunk winning point, 100% the correct point, that says that these semi-automatic rifles and these magazines that hold more than 10 rounds, they're commonly used, meaning in common use by Americans for lawful uh, purposes, which is all that has to be established, technically speaking. We in the Second Amendment community don't actually have to establish that. We literally can sit on our hands once the plain text is implicated. Obviously, the fact that the Second Amendment says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. All you need to do is show if there's a ban or restriction on arms, which obviously is magazines and semi-automatic rifles. Uh, the burden shifts to the government to show that it's somehow legally justified under the Second Amendment history and so on. That is obviously 
in this context impossible because there's tens of millions of Americans own tens of millions of semi-automatic rifles or hundreds of millions of magazines that hold more than 10 rounds. Uh, and the plaintiff's lawyers here did a very good job. Uh, they not only cited to the stuff that's favorable to us, such as the Georgetown Professor Bill English's study, the National, Sur National Firearm Survey of something like 17,000 gun owners, the largest ever uh, that was published in 2021, 2022. Uh, but this brief also talks about some of the studies done by the anti-gun people in the United States, including the Washington Post, no friend of the right to keep and bear arms. And even the Washington Post talks about how, uh, how popular the AR-15s and this brief also goes on, and I think this is a very good find. We talked about this on this channel before over a year ago, that the ATF and their desperation to try to justify some of their silly anti-gun regulations actually admitted in a government document, a filing by the ATF, that the most popular rifle in the United States is the AR-15. And I'm glad to say uh, that attorneys Arrington and Craddock both uh, make a reference to that in this brief. That's very powerful evidence, especially since it's against the interest of the ATF, and yet they made that a concession. Very powerful and proves the obvious that these AR-15s and magazines are in common use for lawful purposes and should be protected. And again, we actually don't have to prove that. The government bears the burden to show that it is not the case that these are in common use. In other words, the government bears the burden to show these are not in common use. Nevertheless, that is obviously impossible to do because they are clearly in common use for lawful for purposes by Americans for all, uh, and there's no dispute about that. Uh, no one can disagree. Uh, this brief goes on and quotes correctly uh, the Bruin case. It's also Heller. It says, quote, the Second Amendment extends prima facie to all instruments that constitute bearable arms. Uh, thus, thus, once the uh, conduct in the case of the restriction or regulation by the government infringes upon uh, the you know firearms that constitutes bearable arms that they all do, then the burden shifts to the government. And again, you know my basic rule on this channel, which uh, the lawyers here articulated, but they didn't say it with, in rhyme uh, because you're writing a legal brief. When in doubt, throw it out. In other words, if there's any doubt about whether or not a modern day gun control law is constitutional, you throw it out. That is the rule for the judges. That is the rule that's set forth not by Mark Smith in the Four Boxes Diner channel, but by the U.S. Supreme Court itself. When in doubt, you throw it out because the burden is on the government to demonstrate that these laws are constitutional, consistent with the historical tradition of regulation in the United States. We'll get to that in just one second. And obviously, there is no way uh, that bans of firearms are. Uh, I'm not even sure there actually have been bans on firearms in American history, but set that issue aside, it doesn't matter because the legal standard is if the firearm is in common use by lawful by Americans for lawful purposes, it's protected, period, full stop. And what we're talking about in these cases right now clearly are protected. The National Association for Gun Rights then goes on and makes the excellent point that a large percentage of the opinion by the district court judge Kendall, a George W. Bush appointee, terribly reasoned, of course. We've talked about this on this channel. I think Justice Barrett is aware of this, has definitely read it, and I'm sure she's shaking her head. Nevertheless, the lawyers did a good job here pointing out the problems with Justice uh, with Judge Kendall's decision. Specifically, they talk about how Judge Kendall spends a lot of time talking about the parade of horribles associated with people misusing firearms. Remember, we all agree that the Second Amendment does not protect the misuse of firearms because at the time of the founding, you could not use a firearm to kill people, to rape people, to rob people. And that has been the case since before before the founding through today. That is the kind of historical tradition of firearms regulation that is consistent with the Second Amendment. And that is the sort of thing the government bears the burden to find to justify a modern gun control law. So if someone commits murder with a gun today, they cannot assert a Second Amendment defense and say, I have a Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. I shot the person for fun and murdered him. No, that can't be a Second Amendment defense because through the historical, the longstanding historical tradition of firearms regulation in America going back before the founding and all the way through today, obviously you cannot misuse firearms to commit murder. That's what they're looking for. Obviously the government simply cannot find this. And no matter how many times the anti-gunners and Judge Kendall talks about people misusing firearms, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about here are banning firearms. We're banning about banning arms for Americans that are not misusing them in any respect. I've written about this before in the Harvard Journal on Public Policy that what you think about is these arms 
are simply sitting in a closet with a particular feature. These magazines are simply sitting in your closet or you're at the gun range and you're using these things. You're not misusing them. And next thing you know, you've committed a felony. You have to go to prison for years for what is a malum prohibitum crime. We've talked about this before, a malum prohibitum crime or a malum prohibitum crime that's victimless is simply absurd that you commit a felony because you have a wrong kind of gun or a wrong kind of magazine that's lawfully protected under the Second Amendment in your closet. Next thing you know, you've committed a crime. This is not a malum in se crime, which is immoral in and of itself, such as rape, robbery, murder, fraud. Those are things that everyone understands to be wrong in their essence as humans, but a malum, malum prohibitum crime, especially a malum prohibitum crime with no victims, which is what these gun bans or magazine ban cases are all about is simply absurd. And I talked about this before, and this is the sort of thing that I think the Seventh Circuit and certainly Justice Barrett is aware of, that the, the dangers of these laws, that's why I think there's the, there, there is a slight chance that there might be an injunction from the Supreme Court in this case. But I think that one thing that's going to cut against it is the fact that this is going to sound weird, but good news for us, it may be bad news for us. And what I mean by that is if you remember Judge Stephen McGuinn entered an injunction in joining these bans statewide in the state of Illinois. So I could see Justice Barrett saying, well, they're already enjoined. I don't, I don't need to do anything here at the Supreme Court because these laws have been enjoined. The Supreme Court could easily say that because a judge in Illinois has enjoined these laws statewide, we, the Supreme Court, don't need to, need to get involved. And therefore, you can see my point that the good news of the injunction at the district court level might make it unnecessary for the Supreme Court to intervene. So the good news actually kind of becomes bad news to a certain degree. But at the end of the day, as long as these laws are not enforced, overall, that is not just good news, that is great news. Now on page 14 of their brief, they do an excellent job. That's the pro Second Amendment plaintiffs do an excellent job talking about a, uh, a dissent from Justice Thomas, joined by Justice Scalia in a case uh, dealing with a assault weapon ban out of Illinois. Basically, they said they would have struck it down. Uh, they do a good job explaining that hell, both Scalia and Thomas thought that the semi-automatic ban uh, that was being challenged in that case was unconstitutional. The only thing I might have added to page 14 in this brief is I might have also thrown in that we also know that another Supreme Court justice, that would be Brett Kavanaugh in the Heller 2 case when he was a judge in the D.C. Circuit, also found that semi-automatic rifles are protected arms and cannot be banned under the Second Amendment. I might have added that to say that here you have Justice Thomas, here you have uh, Brett Kavanaugh, and here you have Justice Scalia, who's no longer with us, but a lot of justices look to him for guidance even today, and therefore it's pretty clear that the U.S. Supreme Court would conclude that semi-automatic rifles and magazines are protected arms just based on those numbers alone. And I might have added the Brett Kavanaugh Heller 2 site to this brief if I were writing this brief, but again, I don't think it's mission critical that that be added. It's just something to keep in mind uh, as this case is litigated going forward. The National Association of Gun Rights does a great job with footnote number six, where they point out that notwithstanding what the Illinois lawyers are arguing, specifically that they're arguing that magazines are not arms, as in the right of the people to keep and bear arms, magazines are not arms because they're not the actual gun. This is obviously silly, and I think uh, the, play, the lawyers in this case in footnote six do a great job explaining this. They cite to the critical language in Bruin that goes like this. It says, quote, um, quote, the plain text covers all modern instruments that facilitate, facilitate armed self-defense. The word facilitate is mission critical. We've talked about this on this channel before. That is right there in the Bruin decision. Obviously, magazines facilitate armed self-defense because they actually allow semi-automatic modern firearms, whether it be handguns or rifles, to function. Obviously, we know in Heller, uh, handguns are protected arms. We know that Justice Alito's concurrence in Caetano in 2016 talks specifically about modern semi-automatic handguns being protected arms. Obviously, what is an essential characteristic for all of these arms, meaning semi-automatic arms, are magazines. Therefore, magazines are obviously a necessary component of the firearm. They help facilitate self-defense, but they're also necessary, and therefore they're clearly protected. There's a lot of language on this. I might have also done two things here in addition to what they did, although I thought they did a great job of the footnote. I might have also added a cite to McCulloch versus Maryland. There's a very good quote in McCulloch. This is a, a very early 19th century case, a very famous case by the, by the Supreme Court that reads, quote, 
a constitution to contain an accurate detail of all subdivisions of which its great powers will admit and of all the means by which they may be carried into execution where partake of the proxicity of a legal code and on and on and on. But the point is, it goes on to say, and I'll put a link to this down below, it goes on to say that the Constitution doesn't have to complain every single little part that may be protected within it. It has things that are necessarily implicated by it. And I give a couple examples there in the context of the First Amendment. It says you have the right to free press. You have the right to free speech. Obviously, it doesn't talk about telephones. It doesn't have the word internet. It doesn't have the word radio. It doesn't have the word ink. It doesn't have the word pen. It doesn't have the word pencil. It doesn't have the word, uh, word printing press or any of these words are not in it. But obviously, in the context of the right to of free press or the context of the right to free speech, these are things that are necessarily implicated by the the text even though it's not in it in the same way magazines as well obviously also in the context of the sixth amendment the sixth amendment deals with the right to counsel you have a right to counsel in a criminal case to have your own lawyer defend you in a criminal case that would include of course by necessity uh the opportunity to be able to meet with your lawyer uh face to face in confidential private settings without people like the government listening in it also allows you of course to have your lawyers bring notepads and pens into uh, the office to sit down to meet with you to take notes to prepare for your defense. None of that is in the express text of the Sixth Amendment right to counsel, but obviously that is ne that is necessary, uh, necessary component of the right to counsel. It also helps facilitate the right to counsel, and therefore, you know, uh, being allowed to bring a pen and a notepad in to meet with a client, it protects the client's Sixth Amendment interest in the same way. So I might have added some of those concepts to the footnote number six, but it's probably not necessary there, but that is one little thing I might have done differently if I was writing this brief. On page 17 of this brief, I think I might have also done something slightly different. I think they did a very good job here. I mean, the, the lawyers for the Second Amendment did an excellent job talking about the importance of, of finding a historical tradition in order to restrict any kind of Second Amendment rights. But of course, they've made it crystal clear that you don't need to talk about historical analogs in the context of an arms ban case. We've talked about this many times on this channel. It's very important that when you're dealing with a government that's banning the possession or banning the sale of a firearm, banning the sale of magazines, that is a gun ban case or an arms ban case subject to the in common use test that's it, period, full stop. If it's in common use, it's protected. You don't have to worry about anything else. Game over. You don't need to talk about historical analogs. Why? Because the Supreme Court in the Heller case already considered the text of the Second Amendment. They considered the definitions of the Second Amendment as they defined it. They talked about, of course, the historical analogs to the extent they exist or they, they did not exist in the context of arms ban cases. So the Supreme Court has already done all the work for everyone, including the lower courts and litigants, in the context of cases that deal with a law that has banned arms so you don't have to redo the work. Nevertheless, the only last two points I want to make, and I really want to compliment the lawyers in this case, I think they did a great job, notwithstanding a couple of observations I made that I might have written the brief slightly differently. I don't think it's material at the end of the day, uh, but just word of the wise for people that are writing briefs on these issues for the future. Again, I don't think it's a material problem at all. I think this brief is overall excellent. I'll put a link to it down below. But there's two additional points I want to bring about this excellent brief by the lawyers for the National Association of Gun Rights. One is... Uh, they did a very nice job pointing out that the use of AR-15s and semi-automatic rifles are rarely used, rarely used in crimes. So while it is wrong to consider interest balancing tests in the context of Second Amendment cases, the Supreme Court has made that crystal clear repeatedly. I do think it's not a bad idea to point out that AR-15s are rare. All rifles in America are rarely used in kind of uh, in crimes, maybe 300 times a year based on like FBI uh, Department of Justice statistics. The reason why it's relevant potentially in the context of the in common use test is if you think about it, the in common use test is as following. Are arms in common use by Americans for lawful purposes, for lawful purposes, and again, since here the brief has already established there's tens of millions of AR-15s and hundreds of millions of these magazines, the fact is that the most they can find based on the government data is maybe 300 instances of rifles being used in homicides in a given year. Obviously, if you do the math, 300 rifles out of tens of millions of them and hundreds of millions of magazines, obviously, they're used overwhelmingly for lawful purposes. So I do think it's okay that the lawyers do mention that there because they made it very clear that interest balancing is not allowed. So it's okay to mention there. I think it's not a bad strategy and probably a good idea. The last point I want to make about this brief by the National Association of Gun Rights is uh, 
something they did that Judge Kendall did not do, and I talked about how sloppy this was on the part of Judge Kendall. Uh, the lawyers here uh, specifically talk about staples. They say, quote, the Supreme Court has described semi-automatic rifles such as AR-15s as widely accepted as lawful possessions. They didn't cite to the Staples versus United States case. I've always told you that whenever you're dealing with this fight involving semi-automatic rifles, dealing with, uh, against like, uh, you know, automatic weapons, cite to the Staples case. That's always the best indication that someone knows what they're talking about because the Supreme Court is already in a very favorable way to us, says that, you know, semi-automatic rifles are commonly owned. It's almost like a Supreme Court press in the Staples case. Very helpful for these kinds of cases and they distinguish it from fully automatic weapons. This is important because in the Heller case, there was dicta in Heller that talks about the possibility that machine guns could be considered not protected arms under the Second Amendment in contrast to semi-automatic rifles. We will have to fight with machine guns down the road, but for now, I wouldn't get into that. Right now, it's a moot point because we're laser focused on semi-autos, but the point is the use of staples to draw that distinction in this brief, I think, made a lot of sense uh, because, uh, again, Judge Kendall, despite trying to compare semi-automatic weapons with machine guns, uh, conveniently, either ig because of ignorance or on purpose chose not to cite the Supreme Court precedent of Staples. And to me, if you're having this fight about machine guns versus semi-automatic rifles and you don't cite the Staples, it's a sign that you're being sloppy. And I can assure you that Justice Amy Coney Barrett is not sloppy in her reasoning. Uh, very shrewd and a very sharp legal mind. Uh, and they all are on the Supreme Court. High IQ individuals, very sharp. They know what they're doing. And these are the kind of things that they will notice uh, because if you can, if I notice it here on the Four Boxes Diner, I can assure you they will notice on the Supreme Court because not only do they have all the justices watching, they have all very sharp law clerks uh, who are very intelligent and very good uh, young lawyers. So someone's going to catch it on that court, I promise you. And the fact that this, uh, uh, that the lawyers here cite to Staples and Judge Kendall did not, will not go lost on the United States Supreme Court in this case. Okay, folks, I know this is a little bit long. I hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't subscribed to the Four Boxes Diner, please do so, and we'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up, table 2A.